All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started here with Aaron Isaacs of the Minnesota Streetcar Museum. Aaron, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your connection to this area and uh, give us some information about the Minnesota Streetcar Museum. Okay, well, um, my connection with Columbia Heights is I went to Columbia Heights schools from uh, grade three through grade nine. Uh, we didn't actually live in Columbia Heights. We lived across the line in that kind of narrow piece of Fridley that runs south uh, between University Avenue and Main Street. We were lived on a little street called Hughes Avenue just, uh, uh, just off of uh, 51st and Main. Uh, I went to Nelson Elementary, which isn't there anymore. It's townhouses now. Uh, then I went to Columbia Heights Junior High in, in the old Junior High building off 41st and Central. And we even had classes in the old Columbia School, which was the elementary school right on the corner of 41st and Central. Um, and uh, they, they made a part of the junior high when I was there. Uh, we moved to Roseville after that. I graduated from Kellogg High School in Roseville in 1967. Um, so if there happened to be any other 1967 Heights graduates around, say hi to me afterwards. Um, and I do certainly have, uh, I, I kind of, even though we lived in Fridley, um, I identified with Columbia Heights. Um, I bought all my baseball cards at the convenience store at 49th and University on the Heights side of the street. Uh, I bought squirt guns. We all bought squirt guns and um, kind of model uh, balsa wood gliders at the Ben Franklin in the 4,000 block of Central. And uh, I remember buying comic books in the drugstore at 40th and Central. And I bought my first 10 speed in a bike store just south of 40th and Central. So that anyway, that's my connection with Central. I mean, with uh, Columbia Heights. Uh, Minnesota Streetcar Museum um, has been around since 1962. And uh, we're the folks who run the streetcars at Lake Harriet. And we also run streetcars at Excelsior. And uh, we've, we have six of them that we've restored that operate, a couple of more that are long-term projects, probably not within my lifetime. And our mission is to preserve the, uh, the history of the streetcars in Minnesota. So we do Duluth and other cities as well as the Twin Cities. And I've written a couple, three books on it. Uh, you, might, you may or may not have seen Twin Cities by Trolley, uh, Twin Ports by Trolley I wrote and a couple of others. Um, and uh, by the way, there's some, uh, several streetcar museum members on here I can see. I saw Pat Cosgrove and Gordy Moore and Leah Harp. So um, thanks for coming guys. So now we can get into this. Uh, I've got a PowerPoint here I'm gonna queue up in a second. What, what you're going to see is a, a streetcar trip from downtown Minneapolis on the Central Avenue line to Columbia Heights. And then there's some more stuff after that. So we'll go to share screen here. And then uh, I did forget to mention, um, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get those to Aaron throughout the uh, presentation. Okay, here we go. Share screen. And, and hopefully everyone is seeing that. Uh, Streetcars to Columbia Heights. And so we started in downtown Minneapolis. Now the, the Central Avenue line was through all the, all the Minneapolis lines for the most part were what they called through routed, which is to say you came down through one end of the city, went through downtown and went out to the opposite side of the city. And so the Central Avenue line was through routed with Bloomington Avenue. So it went all the way out to 54th and Bloomington in South Minneapolis. So we're not gonna look at that part of it. But when it came into town, it went right in front of what was the Metrodome is now uh, the US Bank Stadium and went up 4th Street past City Hall till it got to 2nd Avenue South. And it turned at 2nd Avenue South onto 2nd Avenue. And that's the corner with the Metropolitan Building. You know, the, the famous uh, loss to historic preservation in uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, and so this particular line kind of had a weird routing in downtown because it, it was separated by several blocks from the other lines. Transferring to it was, it sort of, it sort of went through the southern edge of downtown. So now we're going to follow it all the way out. And so here we are at the corner of uh, 4th Street uh, we're basically looking the other way. I'm sorry, we're at the corner of 3rd Street. This is 3rd Street crossing here and 2nd Avenue South. And uh, you can see this picture is taken in the 1940s. 
If you look up ahead there, you can see the main downtown post office. Um, and, uh, you know, a whole bunch of old buildings that were part of that whole gateway urban renewal thing, that rather unfortunate occurrence, and they're all gone. And so the streetcar, when it got to the end of 2nd Avenue South, it turned onto 1st Street right in front of the main post office, and it went a block over to 3rd Avenue South and across the 3rd Avenue Bridge. This is a newspaper photo. Clearly, something has restricted traffic here, which is why traffic backups attracted newspaper photographers. And so we have a certain number of these news photos where traffic is always backed up. And all these photos come from the collection of the Minnesota Streetcar Museum. We have about 13,000 photos um, of all over Minnesota. And that's been kind of one of my projects is to uh, build that up. Here's another view of the Third Avenue Bridge. This is in the early year days, probably about 1930. And you're looking at the Minneapolis Exposition Center. Uh, let me just, there we go. You're looking at the Minneapolis Exposition Center, which uh, sat here. There are townhouses here. After this came down, it was replaced by a Coca-Cola bottling plant that was there for quite a while. But this functioned as um, like the auditorium. I'm, I'm told they had the, uh, the National Republican Party Convention here one year. Um, hey, there are, uh, yes. We have, a, we, have, we have a question for you. Sure. Uh, in that last photo, were cars able to drive on the streetcar? Uh, lines as well. Oh yeah. Let's see now. Why? Oh, hang on a sec. Um, yeah, the streetcar tracks were not uh, on their exclusive right of way within the streets, uh, with, with one or two little exceptions. Uh, they were just in the streets, and anything could drive on them. So streetcars had a lot had a lot of trouble with traffic. Uh, here's a view of the Third Avenue Bridge from the East End. Um, for those of you who don't remember, you actually had railroad tracks running down along Main Street. Now you can also see the old Hennepin Avenue Bridge, the, uh, the double arched bridge before the new suspension bridge. So now we're up on the Exhibition Center. This is, um, this is uh, Central Avenue. Here's Second Street. I'm sorry, this is, I'm sorry, this is University Avenue right here. Um, this is the park with the Stevens House in it. This is 4th Street Southeast. Um, this Aveda building, which was the SNH department store then, this is the Labor Temple. And uh, by the way, the streetcar employees were unionized and uh, Amalgamated Transit Union Local 1005 was and is today uh, the unionized uh, organization for all the Metro Transit uh, employees. Out here in the distance, um, this is one of the big, there are a couple of these big natural gas holders. Um, and as the amount of gas was used, this thing would go down. It was, it was a, a sliding lid uh, and a rubber walls inside, uh, inside a steel framework. So here it is, uh, the SNL department store. This is the Como Harriet streetcar line crossing, headed for Dinky Town on the right. And you see, you know, you see companies like Obel Moving and Storage, I think is still around. Uh, so we're moving further up central. This is the corner of 7th Street, which once it crosses over the railroad tracks, turns into Monroe Street Northeast. This gives you a real good idea of um, what the, the tracks in the street were like. Um, although the pavement differed in a lot of places, lots and lots of it was laid in these granite blocks. And periodically, a lot of this is still out there underneath about an inch or two of asphalt that they just laid over when the streetcars were gone. And um, when, they, when they finally decide to go and dig down and take the tracks out and repave the street, uh, these, these blocks look like granite loaves of bread, and they have a tendency to disappear very quickly from the construction site because everybody comes and takes them. And then, of course, here you see the overhead wire, and for those of you who don't know, the streetcars were powered by electricity, 600 volts of DC, 
the trolley wire, I'm sorry, the trolley pole would extend up from the streetcar and a wheel there, you can see the wheel would roll along the wire uh, and the power would go down, be controlled by the motorman here, go down to uh, four motors that were geared to uh, one, one geared to each axle of the streetcar and that's how it ran. And then the tracks, this was the positive, the tracks were the negative. And so if you were tall enough to go and stand barefoot on the tracks while grasping the overhead wire, you would die. But uh, uh, very few people could do that. Okay, we're moving further up. Central has now straightened and gone north and we're looking up the hill towards the uh, intersection of Broadway and Central, which is elevated over the railroad tracks. And of course, this reminds you that there were a lot of brick streets back in the Twin Cities then. And you can see this is dated 1953 which was the year the Central Avenue line was, uh, was converted to bus. This is an early photo. It's pre-1920 and you can tell that because of the pinstriping on the streetcars. Um, and this is uh, apparently the original bridge intersection of Broadway and Central was, was a wood bridge. And then later it was uh, converted to steel and concrete. This isn't a real good photo, but this is later. And this is right at the intersection. This building is still here. It's the Land of Nod Mattress Factory. And you go in there now as full of artists and you know, consultants and uh, you know, people like that. It's got, a, it's got a coffee house in it. So now we're up at Broadway and we're looking north. Um, and you can see up here, this is uh, the Burlington Northern at the time, Northern Pacific Railroad Bridge. And that it's a different bridge now, but it's still there. That kind of gives you a landmark. And this whole area was very industrial, still is. And so uh, here's the bridge. Now, this was it when it was completed in 1924. And before that, uh, the tracks crossed a grade and uh, the city mandated um, starting in about 1920, that uh, the two railroad lines that cut diagonally across Northeast, they were the Great Northern and the Northern Pacific, they're now Burlington Northern Santa Fe, that, uh, that, that those be grade separated. And so there's a whole construction album over at Minnesota Historical Society that shows that. And uh, here is a picture from that. This is during the construction, you're on the grade of the Northern Pacific, but they have, uh, created what they called a shoe fly, which is a, a, a bypass so they can build the bridge. And then this is Central Avenue here, and they put a shoe fly streetcar line to, to get around the construction site. So that went on for a couple of years, and they did a whole bunch of bridges. They did Johnson Street, Fillmore Street, um, uh, Monroe, uh, Washington Street Northeast, from the period of about 1920 to about 1932, and that caused that whole line uh, to be elevated through Northeast Minneapolis. Okay, now we're headed Northeast, and I forget which diner this was. Um, uh, if anyone knows, you know, chime in. Here you can see there are movie theaters everywhere, the Orion Movie Theater. And we're up in Central, here's Northwestern, the Fifth Northwestern National Bank, I think it is. And that bank in a different form is still there. Um, and my, now, by the way, this photo was taken by a motorman named Ed Nelson. And Ed was crazy for streetcars and was one of the earliest historians of the streetcars, did a great deal of work uh, worked for the streetcar company until the streetcars quit in 1954, and he was so brokenhearted that he moved to Toronto, which never got rid of its streetcars and ran streetcars there until he retired. But um, and, uh, we, we got, yeah. Uh, either Crest Diner or Ideal Diner? The Crest Diner, that's it. The Crest, I believe they called it the Crest Eat Shop, now that I remember. And by the way, one of the things you can see, the overhead wire is held up by cast iron poles that the streetcar company uh, made in its own foundry. And they had this kind of a distinctive cap on them. And so you can see there's one on each side of the street and there'd be a span wire going across and then the, uh, um, the trolley wire would be centered in the street. Here's the corner of Lowry and Central. 
1953 looking south. You know, pretty much all these buildings are here, except uh, this one, this one burned down. That was B sharp music uh, for many, many years. Now this is a really old photo. Um, electricity became practical uh, in eight, late 1889. And so by 1891, they had converted all these lines that were drawn by horses to, to electric cars. And this is one of the early electric cars. Uh, and the location is about 28th Avenue uh, Northeast because it's passing the Sioux Line Shoreham shops at Roundhouse, which were built there in 1881. And here at the time, you can see it's a Central Avenue, and at the time it was paired with 8th Avenue, which is Chicago Avenue. 8th Avenue was later renamed Chicago. Okay, now we've gone quite a ways north, and we're almost in Columbia Heights. And this is just north of where the Sioux Line Railroad Crossing is, just north of Columbia Park. And um, the Sioux Line Crossing crossed Central Avenue in 1881. Well, the streetcar came along and I want to say about 1905. Um, and, uh, and because of that, because the streetcar was the second railroad at the, at the crossing, they had to maintain the crossing. And in order to reduce the expense of maintaining the crossing, they narrowed down to one track to cross the Sioux Line, which would have been right behind us. And then they widened back out to double track. Now, this is an unusual thing. This curving third track is the track of the Minneapolis Filtration Railway, which served the waterworks. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to that later in the program. I'll explain it further. How fast did the streetcars, how fast could they get up to and how fast did they normally travel? Well, they could get up to 45 or 50 miles an hour. Now, the truth is that they were generally running at street speed, you know, 25, 30, 35 miles an hour. They didn't have speedometers, so nobody, you know, nobody really knew how fast they were going unless you drove next to them. But, um, and just to give you an example, uh, because they made stops, um, they averaged really the same speed as, as a bus. The Central Avenue line and mo most local streetcar and bus lines average about 12 miles an hour. Now they're getting up to 30, 35, but because they're stopping every block or two, the average speed is about 12 miles an hour. And uh, therefore, a six mile trip, which would be kind of typical from downtown up to uh, the end of the line at Columbia Heights would be about a half hour trip, which is what it is today on the number 10 bus. Looking, looking at this uh, uh, path, how did, you know, you, you mentioned they stop every block or so. Did they have, you know, kind of like a crossing guard on the, or an arm that would come down, or is it just kind of run out and out uh, across the street and you're on your own, or how did that work? Nope, nope, uh, you, you walked out into the middle of the street and got on. And it was illegal to pass a streetcar on the right, because if you pass the streetcar in your automobile on the right, you might hit somebody. Um, and it was also illegal to pass a streetcar period. It was like a school bus. And frankly, that was one of the reasons that the public wanted to get rid of them and switch to buses is that if you were following a streetcar and it was stopping about every block, so were you with your automobile, whereas buses could pull over to the curb and get out of your way. And in downtown, they, they put up signs that said safety zone because you'd have crowds of people standing out in the street with automobiles passing between them and the curb. Uh, and then in some, a few places, especially University Avenue in right, St. Paul, they actually put up safety islands that the people could stand on. And when automobiles started running over the safety islands and hitting people, they put up big concrete bulldozers to actually wreck the automobile before it, it hit the people. So it was an issue. So here's an advertisement for Columbia Heights. Um, not quite sure where in Columbia Heights this would have been. Um, and Reservoir Hills. Now this is the corner, I got two shots here that are at the corner of 37th and Central. And you can see the city limit sign for Minneapolis over here. Uh, and you're looking down, you can see the, uh, the gray of the railroad grade crossing down here. Um, what's happening is that in 19, um, I wanna say 1952, 
uh, the streetcars were on the way out and the streetcar company cut it back from 40th and 5th Street in Columbia Heights to 37th and Central and people had to transfer to a bus to go further. And that's what's happening here. This streetcar has just come up. It's let these people out and they're walking over to catch the bus. Now, in this view, the streetcar has pulled across the intersection and is backing into what you call a Y. It's backing into the Y on the side street and that will allow it to reverse direction. And then it'll pull out. And here you see the connecting bus and all the people waiting to get on it. And here's something called the Hilltop Grocery Store. And that's where that Bridgman's uh, was for many years. Okay, we're now up at 40th and Central. This is a newspaper photo, a little civic celebration of some kind. Um, and this building is still there, I believe. Not a drugstore anymore. I don't know what's in it. Um, but this is where I used to buy my comic books. Now here's another view of the same intersection with the streetcar turning from uh, Central Avenue onto 40th. And here's uh, a different angle. Here you're looking north. Can't see much, but you can see other buildings. And now we're going west on 40th. And this is two blocks west. I forget it, Polk or whatever it is. Um, this church is still there. Today, it doesn't have the arched window and it's got an addition in the front that brings it all the way to the sidewalk, but this church is still there. And I, um, sorry to interrupt, but I believe no, no, the, white building, uh, the white building in the background was a um, uh, police station back in the day. Oh yeah? Okay. Wow. And now we're a few blocks west of that Jefferson, I believe, where there's that little, little rise on 40th Avenue. And here's another picture that's very similar to it, just a little bit to the west of that. And by the way, all these, most of these photos that are not like newspaper photos, the, there's a whole subculture of trolley fans out there. And these were guys who were either local or many of them came in from places like Chicago or even the West Coast or New York. And they took these pictures and over time we've, we've been able to acquire these private collections of photos. Um, and that's how, that's how we have the documentation of this. And then uh, Aaron, uh, if you want to go back, that, uh, that house, I believe, oh, no, uh, forward one more. Yeah. Yep, right there. I believe that house is uh, still standing there in, uh, here in Columbia Heights. Yeah, uh, what will happen is when I have a photo, there, you know, not all these photos are captioned. And so when I have a photo I can't identify, you know, usually I can tell what line it's on because I'll see the destination sign on the streetcar. And so I'll either go out or I'll get on Google Street View. And often you can find them just because the buildings or, you know, are still there. So now we're at the end of the line at uh, 40th and uh, 5th Avenue. And uh, I did not know until uh, I talked to Will and Will had somebody that this was the Columbia Heights Hotel here behind it. And that that was actually built by Thomas Lowry who built the streetcar line. Lowry, oh, Lowry was a real estate developer, even though streetcar, and he wound up getting involved in streetcars so he would have some way to transport people to and from his real estate developments. And uh, he bought a thousand acres in Columbia Heights and developed quite a bit of it. And so uh, that's the reason for this hotel. And what we found out is that uh, because Lowry owned the hotel, um, when the motorman needed to take a potty break, he could go into the hotel and do it. Now, this is the same location looking in the other direction. The streetcar, this is 40th going across, and the cars would come in and they would back up into the Y so that they would be sitting where you saw that last picture, and then they would turn and go. And this is 1952 or 53, and they're, they're now tearing the thing up. Here you see some of these big, what they call the, uh, granite Belgian blocks, those kind of loaf, loaf of bread sized blocks that I was telling you about. Uh, these buildings are still there. Oh, okay. okay. So, so anyway, that's the, the, the streetcar line. But Columbia Heights had another 
yeah. unusual streetcar line, the Minneapolis filtration plant railway yeah. that I was telling you about yeah. earlier. It hasn't been good. I think we've got the, somebody, uh, Joseph Finley, yeah. can you mute yeah. yourself? Um, and so uh, this line was built um, to, f to bring uh, materials up to uh, the waterworks and reservoir up at the upper end of Reservoir Boulevard, which was city of Minneapolis's reservoir, but it was in Columbia Heights. And um, they, they bought this uh, little passenger car slash locomotive that was capable of hauling freight cars up the hill to it. And they just hauled freight for a couple of years. But the people who lived up along here said, well, it's set up for passengers. Uh, oh, by the way, they were hauling employees up there as well. The employees would take the Columbia Heights streetcar out to up the 37th Central, and then they transferred to this to go to work. And then a resident okay. said, could you start uh, hauling regular passengers? And so the city decided to do it, but not very often. Aaron, uh, here's, uh, sure, once sure. again, we've got... Uh, Aaron, uh, Shirley Jackson is saying that the granite blocks were given to the residents and they, uh, they had okay. some art in Fridley. Very good. Okay, so here you see somebody getting on the, the little trolley and has a sign for the Hilltop Golf Links. I don't know where that was. Um, that, was uh, oh, that, was a, that was a golf course up next to the, to the Waterworks uh, filtration plant. Okay, I wasn't aware yeah. of that. So anyway, this is the schedule. And for the line, it only ran one, two, three, four, five, six. It only ran eight times a day. Um, and then, of course, it would you know haul freight cars. Uh, but it was a very limited schedule. The fare was three cents. There was no free transfer. You had to pay that and then pay your other nickel or dime or whatever to get on the regular streetcar. And uh, you can see, and by the way, this was back during a six-day work week. And so Saturday was considered a weekday at the time. That's why it shows Sundays as a separate schedule. Um, and so here you are inside the little car. Uh, this, this, this line was famous because when it opened in about 1914 or so, um, it had one guy who was its motorman until 1952. And uh, he became kind of a local celebrity. As a matter of fact, there was a newspaper story that every single, uh, that twice a day, once in the morning and once in the afternoon, he would go into the Hilltop Grocery down at 37th and Central and have a Coke. But, uh, so anyway, this is what the line looked like. You're looking from, from like 37th and Central up Reservoir Boulevard, and it ran just along the side of the street. Here's another view. This is low. This is about from a block, a block north of 37th, looking down to 37th and Central. And once again, here at Reservoir was a brick street. How, how come um, these tracks are along the sidewalk and not, you know, in the middle of the road? Um, that's just where they put them. Um, I, I, I guess they had the option of doing it, and uh, they're they're in the public right of way. And uh, maybe they just decided, hey, you know, we, we don't want to run in the middle of the street. And, and that could be because it was designed really as a freight railroad. I don't know. Good question. Another view. These are a couple of photos from a newspaper story. And here you are. Uh, this is... Uh, up at the waterworks, uh, the, the line at right, it had a little single car uh, car barn. That's where this goes. And then the, the line at left goes up to the waterworks. Here you are coming in next to the reservoir. This is where the thing ended. And uh, here's the motorman. And you, at least you can see what color it was and uh, their little storage shed for it. And the, and the connection with Thomas Lowry and the waterworks is uh, in the late 1800s, he donated or uh, sold very cheaply that land at the Minneapolis waterworks as um, uh, typhoid fever was the big uh, uh, disease during that time. And so they helped with the new, with the new water plant helped uh, 
uh, purify the water. So Thomas Lowry, not only with the streetcars and kind of everything on the south side of Columbia Heights, but he, uh, he had a lot of land um, uh, in Columbia Heights. And, and Dolores is wondering, were the streetcars heated? And if so, how? Uh, the streetcars were heated and there were, there were two methods. Uh, they were heated, well, actually three. Uh, when they were originally built, there was a coal-fired stove that sat on the front platform behind the motorman, and it circulated water through hot water pipes that ran along uh, both walls of the streetcar, and so it was a hot water system. Now, they replaced that in the 1920s with a different coal-fired heater and a forced air system. And I think the reason for that was you had to actually climb up into the streetcar into the front platform to stoke the fire and remove the ashes. And I also think that because the streetcars are made out of wood and the body's flexed, I think the, uh, uh, the hot water pipes had a tendency to leak. So when they went to forced air, they created a coal fired heater uh, that was located amidships on the right side of the streetcar that you could, you could feed coal into it and take the ashes out standing next to the streetcar. You didn't have to climb into the streetcar. Um, and then they had about a half, they had about 60 streetcars that they put electric heaters in, which were just like, like the heater elements in your toaster. Uh, and even the coal fired ones had those electric element heaters on the front and rear platforms. So yeah, they were heated. Did you have another one come in there, Will? Uh, Shirley was mentioning that the uh, Hilltop Golf Clubhouse was located on 45 or 45th and Chatham, which is near the near the waterworks area. And then there's, uh, I believe, a Fairway Drive and a couple of. Well, that's streets. why Fairway. That's why Fairway Drive is called Fairway Drive. How about that? Yep. And then um, I, I don't have it with me right now, but. Um, we had a longtime resident. He drew a map of the golf course um, from memory, and so um, there was uh, an author in uh, Minnesota who wrote a book called uh, "Lost Golf Courses in Minnesota," and one of those is about the uh, Hilltop Golf Course. Oh, okay. Huh. So um, here at shift change time, this is a Star Tribune photo, and you see the crew. Uh, getting off work and they're going to ride the streetcar down and transfer at 37th and Central. And now, on average, how many people would be able to fit comfortably in a streetcar, either the filtration plant or just the the normal um, the normal one that would go down Central? The regular streetcar is 50. This one probably about 40. It's a little bit shorter. 40, 35, something like that. Now, of course, the primary reason was to use it to, um, uh, to bring materials up there. I forget what this stuff is. Uh, oh, liquid chlorine, it says right on the car. There you go. And I think they also hauled sand up there for the sand filters. And so you remember they, they came down and they had their own track next to the streetcar down to the Sioux Line Crossing. This is a Sioux Line Crossing. And once again, here you can see the double track streetcar line dropping to one track to cross the railroad. And up here, this is electrically charged wire mesh because what you didn't want to have happen was the trolley pole to come off the wire while a streetcar was sitting on the railroad tracks. You wanted it to be able to power through. And so even if the trolley pole came off the wire, it would contact this electrically charged mesh, which would provide power to the motors and you could get the streetcar off the railroad tracks. And this is, this is almost certainly uh, a hopper full of sand uh, to go up to the filtration plant. Here's another one of the chlorine hoppers. So you're, you're at Central Avenue uh, and there was a little siding here and this is where they'd hand this over to the Sioux line. Now this little line had one misadventure and that was um, in 1945, uh, the, the little car was sitting here and for some reason the, the brakes bled off and you know, it's a, the Sioux line is on a hill going down into Shoreham Yards. And this thing rolled all the way down into the yard by the roundhouse. 
by itself with nobody on it. And so this is the newspaper photo of uh, the Sioux Line uh, locomotive has brought it back to where it belongs. And of course, here you have guys in suits, which is what happens, you know, management turns out when something goes wrong like that. Now, I have a one last segment here, and this is about the Lincoln funeral car. And as you, you probably all know that uh, Abraham Lincoln's funeral car was purchased by Thomas Lowry and was parked uh, in Columbia Heights until it burned in 1911. Well, uh, Lowry was, was from Illinois. Lincoln actually was, for a while was Lowry's lawyer, Lowry's father's lawyer. And Lowry became a lawyer himself and patterned himself after Abraham Lincoln. He felt Lincoln was his idol. Hey, Aaron, um, we, have a, we have a question for you. Yep. Um, why was a separate grade not required between the Sioux line and uh, streetcar line on Central at Columbia Parkway like it was at about 15th Avenue for Burlington Northern? Oh, you mean why didn't they grade separate it? Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. It might be that uh, the engineering, um, it might be that uh, uh, it was too challenging of an engineering thing. I don't honestly know. It is one of the few places where a mainline railroad in Minneapolis continued to cross the street at grade. Almost all of the others were grade separated, but I can't tell you why it didn't happen here. Sorry. So anyway, um, one of the connections apparently between Lowry and Lincoln was that Lowry's brother died in a Civil War battle on the day that Lincoln was assassinated. That's what I have read. So uh, the Lincoln funeral car, um, which was supposed to be kind of the Air Force One of its day, but Lincoln never used it when he was alive. It carried his body back to Springfield, Missouri. So it was a very celebrated vehicle. And um, after that, it was retired and uh, the Union Pacific Railroad bought it as an official, as an official's car. And it lasted with the Union Pacific, was downgraded into sort of maintenance away service because it became obsolete after about 30 years and passed into private hands and was displayed at a couple of world's fairs, like the big exposition in St. Louis, which I think was like 1902, 1904. And after that, it was available. Lowry heard about it and said, I want to get that. And he, he bought the car and he uh, took it to the streetcar shops, which were at 31st and Nicollet. And by the way, if you go to 31st and Nicollet, there's a Metro Transit bus garage today there. And the reason that garage is there is that it used to be the streetcar shops. And so this photo, which is taken in uh, 1905, uh, it's either 1905 or 1906. And you're at the streetcar shop and here you can actually see the Lincoln private car sitting here. Um, Lowry told his son, Horace Lowry, who later became the streetcar company president to, he gave him the job of restoring the car because a lot of components were missing and all that. And so um, they, it took a lot of work, but they fixed the car up. And since Lowry owned property in Columbia Heights, he placed it up, uh, I believe on the south side of 37th uh, at Quincy and um, exhibited it there. And uh, the Grand Army of the Republic would come to town and people would make pilgrimages to it. And we have in our collection this brochure that Twin City Lines put out on how to visit the historic Lincoln car located in Columbia Heights. And here's what the car looked like when it was built. And of course, it's all kinds of bunting and stuff on it. And uh, here's the map from the brochure. You would, they said, board at the West Hotel downtown. And the line back then ran on Hennepin. And here you see little streetcars, the streetcar line. Here's Columbia Heights. There's the reservoir. Oddly on this sign, they don't actually show the location, but it would have been just, a, would have been just about here. And, uh, and so the, uh, this is the view from where it sat. This is yeah, the center fold of the brochure. I couldn't fit it all on my scanner. And you probably recognize it because here goes the Sioux line through Columbia Park and here's that footbridge that's there to this day that kind of oriented. Uh, and uh, this would be um, Columbia Parkway, I believe. Um, and so of course, what, what happened, it was up there being displayed. 
<clears throat> and a prairie fire came along and burned it to the ground. And <clears throat> people came and got pieces of it. According to one newspaper story, uh, one man out of pieces of wood made a violin. Nobody knows who that violin is today. So anyway, that's the last slide I've got, folks. And if we got questions, we can stop the share there. And we could uh, really do this directly if you want. Well, I don't know. Yeah, um, Sarah, if, if uh, you want to go back to the last qu our slide, um, Sarah and Jack are wondering, does that photo of the golf course show what used to be a lake? Uh, just a minute. Let me, uh, I got to go back to it. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would be Lake, Sa lake Sandy over there, wouldn't it? Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, good point. Yeah, and uh, that area right around 37th and Quincy uh, used to be the Architects Avenue. Um, back in 1904, 1905, Thomas Lowry and uh, the developers hosted a contest for architects, and it's the Architects Ave uh, Avenue area. And uh, people would come up on the streetcar and go visit uh, all, the, all these houses that were being built and, um, and pick their favorites. And there's a couple articles about that. And um, um, according to plat maps, that used to be in Columbia Heights. And then there was some uh, exchanges of land between Columbia Heights and Minneapolis back in the day. So now it's on the Minneapolis side. And um, yeah, we'll uh, open it up for questions. Um, and by the way, uh, Kathy Kohlberg, who's a local house historian, is doing is trying to do a book on Architects Avenue. I don't know if she's talked to you or not. Yeah, I actually got a hold of her yesterday, and um, we're working on booking a uh, Zoom presentation just like this for uh, mid-May, and then hopefully a walking tour in September. So that's a that's a great segue. Okay. So yeah, if anyone here has a, a question, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask away. I have a question in terms of, you had said where uh, the railroad had uh, grazed horses. Do we know where that was within Columbia Heights? I don't think I said that. What the, well, what was that? Where did that come from? The, the railroad grazed horses. I not. I don't. I don't recall that. It was on the city page of that for the announcement for this presentation. Oh, uh, Will. Yep, there was uh, an article. I believe it's from the the Twin City Trolley um, uh, publication. Um, I don't have it offhand, but uh, it was uh, information we used for this. I can. Uh, I can pull that up and uh, send that out over to Ray later. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's not sounding familiar to me. So, uh, okay. I I'm just curious because within our, on our abstract, our property was originally owned by Thomas Lowry and then the Arcade Investment Corporation and whatever was part of a 640 acre parcel. So we're the Southwest corner of Columbia Heights or South East corner of Columbia Heights. Hmm. Okay. I mean, maybe somebody had a farm up there or something, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm unaware of anything having to do with the uh, streetcars and horses that would have been in Columbia Heights. And then uh, if you want to pull up the photo of the Reservoir Boulevard, uh, I believe those trees all along the Reservoir were uh, elms. Uh, Tammy is saying, and they may or may not uh, have been impacted uh, uh, through the Dutch there elms. It wouldn't surprise me if they were Dutch elms. I mean, they had them everywhere else. Here's another view. Uh, Renee is wondering if uh, storms ever took down uh, the streetcar wires and, you know, how would that uh, obviously impact the uh, travel? It definitely did. Um, we've got pictures of where tornadoes did it. There was a tornado that went through Hopkins, and if it tore down the wires, the, the streetcars could do nothing. 
Uh, they, they had no power. And, um, and also, of course, if it uh, knocked down trees and overhead wire poles across the tracks, you also had to uh, remove those. Yeah, there were all kinds of things that could prevent streetcars from running. Um, because the motors were mounted on the trucks next to the wheels, uh, if you got a foot of water over the tracks flooding, the streetcar couldn't run through that because it would short out the motors. Or if you had, or if you had, you know, crash and hit an automobile, uh, they didn't have any way to detour. And so, uh, or if one of them derailed for some reason, uh, there, there were all kinds of things that would shut down the streetcar line. Anyone else have any uh, questions for Aaron? And Aaron, uh, again, where are you located and how can people uh, find out more about the Minnesota Streetcar Museum? Well, if you go to trolleyride.org, that's our website. There's a lot of stuff on there, among other things. Um, uh, we have uh, about 2,500 historic photos that you can uh, look at online. Um, it's, uh, you go under historic photos and there's a link that takes you right to Minnesota Reflections, which is the Minnesota Digital Library that we participate in. And by the way, if you haven't gone on to Minnesota Digital Library it's, uh, and you're a historian, it's worth it because there's 150,000 photos in there from about 150 uh, small museums and uh, historical societies. Uh, so there's a lot of information there. We've got, um, the, the other thing if uh, you, you might do is go onto YouTube and under YouTube, um, if you can find, uh, if you Google, or not Google, but the search on YouTube and say 1950s Como Harriet, and I put together a 42 minute video from, from actual footage from the 1950s that takes you from downtown Minneapolis to downtown St. Paul and out. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, even though we're shut down and we're not running streetcars, although we're hoping to by July, uh, if COVID goes away, uh, we've got a lot of uh, ways you can access information. Wonderful. Well, thank you for your, your time, Aaron. Uh, this was a fun presentation to learn about the history of streetcars. And, and uh, everyone, thank you for attending.